May the Lord bless you. this service at St John's it's Trinity 5 and as we begin the service we remember we stand in the presence of God Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And we say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. My brothers and sisters, as we prepare to celebrate the presence of Christ in word and sacrament, let us call to mind and confess our sins. And we say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us all our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. And as people who have been forgiven, we say together the Gloria. 
glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. So let us pray. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you, that we, loving you in all things, and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we have the readings. The reading is from the second episode to the Corinthians Chapter 2, verses 2 to 10. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up to paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weakness. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than that what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it will leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, to that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face shine down on you and show. Oh 
Lord turn his face to you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace and show you grace The Lord be with you. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joses, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honour except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages, teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals, and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons, and anointed with oil many who were sick, and cured them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning. I'd like to speak about our Corinthians passage this morning, um, where... Paul says the following things. This is 2 Corinthians 12, 2 to 10. Paul says this, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, with insults, hardships and persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. This letter is written by Paul towards the end of his ministry when things are not necessarily going well for him. Paul is the single most important author in the New Testament. He's travelled through the whole of the known world for the gospel, founded many churches and many communities, and yet as he approaches the end of his mission, several things become clear to us. He had opposition and division. He was getting a lot of flack, and especially in Corinth. And his first letter and other letters, which we don't have, had clearly not solved these matters. And if anything, they were getting worse. 
But also, as we read in this passage, he has something which he calls a thorn in the flesh, some kind of affliction. It might have been mental, physical or spiritual, but it won't go away. And it's serious. It's, it's debilitating for him. It's distressing. And he pleads with the Lord to take this thorn away. And his testimony is that Jesus replies to him. The answer to his prayer is, my grace is sufficient for you, for my, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, that's not an answer that I would have enjoyed receiving. I'm aware that many of us have had afflictions in the past 12 months and suffer still today. I know that many have suffered loss, hardship and um, negative experiences, to put it mildly. So I'm led to explore what it means to say and believe that the grace of Christ is sufficient for us. And what it means to say that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Because neither of these two things are natural things for us to say or for us to believe. And they're certainly not what we're taught by the world. So, number one, my grace is sufficient for you, says Jesus. Do we believe that? What is grace? Well, grace is favour that is not earned and cannot be earned. Grace is given to us freely with neither a request nor effort nor any precondition, but crucially without merit. Before I was priested, I was ordained a deacon. That's just the way it's done. And while you're a deacon, there are certain things you can't do, one of which is preside at the Eucharist, but also you're not allowed to use the priestly blessing in common worship. You're actually given an alternative one. And it actually, I prefer it. I think it's better. It's from Numbers 6, where the Lord says to Moses, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. And listen to this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. I like that. God's grace is that inner knowledge, the awareness that God's face is shining on you. It is an awareness that leads to inner peace. Whatever the storm is like raging outside, that gives us peace. And in that sense, God's grace is sufficient, whether the storm passes or persists. It's a whole new level of intimacy with Jesus and awareness that he is present all the time. If we simply make Jesus the object of religious veneration, then we're not going to sense the face of God shining on us in the words of that blessing. Grace, the word grace, is, is very often associated with the hymn, Amazing Grace. And if I'd planned ahead, we would have used that in this service, but I looked it up and we used it last week. So I'm sure you remember how it went. It's written in 1772 by a repentant slave trading sailor called John Newton. And it was to some extent based on his own life, conduct and self-awareness, particularly his inner rebellion and angst and sin and cruelty that Newton used to channel into this hymn. Newton lost his mother very young. His father went to sea. He was raised by a rather distant stepmother. He suffered uh, cruelty at school. Today we'd call it bullying or, or abuse. And he was press ganged into the Navy. That's not such a great recipe, is it? And he became renowned for violent uh, disobedience, for being a troublemaker, and even for composing profane songs about the officers, which apparently pushed the, the limits of language even beyond which was normal in the Navy. Anyway, he leaves the Navy, but continues at sea and becomes involved in the Atlantic slave trade. In 1748, his ship is so threatened by a storm that he despairs of his own efforts to save himself 
and his men and cries out to God for mercy. The storm continues for many hours, but he does not die. He carries on slave trading for another eight years. And only then, meditating on this incident, does he start to study theology, become a writer and an abolitionist. God saved him while he was yet a sinner, with no repentance and no, um, no discontinuity in what he was doing and no merit of his own. And that leads him to pen the phrase, amazing grace, 24 years later. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you because it is not based on anything you've earned, done, said or failed to do. It's not earned or forfeited and it is not owed to you. God has no debtors. It is given. That is why God's grace is sufficient. It's God's face shining upon you. Well, let's move on. Paul says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. These are the words of Jesus that he's quoting. Strength made perfect in weakness, I would say, goes against everything we are ever taught. We're raised to hide weakness, to deal with weakness, to be strong, independent. That is all good and well. But faith, and this is Paul's point, is about dependence on Christ, not on ourselves. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And that is true when I allow my weaknesses to be there, when I acknowledge them, when I realise that I depend on Christ and not on my, myself. My weakness is no longer a disqualification, but a qualification, because I start to allow God to work and not to strive. Our weakness, when we acknowledge it and understand it, means we have no choice but to yield and trust to God. When we continue to think that we can do it, that it's all down to us, then we're not waiting for his lead and we're not trusting in his power. Our infirmities, our imperfections, our weaknesses are the very things that we are taught to keep out of sight and under wraps. Yet it is in those things that the power of Christ rests upon us. We boldly approach the throne of grace in our weakness, not in our strength and not in our merit. Hiding our weakness from the world inadvertently places us in a position where we subconsciously hide it from God as well, or at least we try to. When we fall short, we no longer seek his face. We just keep trying even harder, failing to realise that this is the time when we need him the most. When we boast in our infirmities, as Paul says, we say, look what God has done through me, perhaps even despite me, not because of me. And that is what we call a testimony. It's a beacon of hope for others who are going through the same self-doubt, the same affliction and the same weakness. Because if we pretend otherwise, Christianity begins to seem firstly unattainable and secondly a pretense. There are people who would gladly embrace the gospel if it were not for believers pretending. Jesus calls them hypocrites, actors, people who wear masks, who simply make out that things are what they are not. So let us summarise. We can see from Paul's life and his honesty that discipleship was not all plain sailing. We can see from our gospel reading that this was true for Jesus himself. We miss sell Christ and the gospel when we make out that things will be easier if we walk with Jesus. The truth is that following Christ presents its own difficulties with, with reproaches, with persecutions and distress. We've never been promised an easy road. The clincher in all of this comes in the last part of this verse, where Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. His strength is no longer found in trying to solve it all by himself. Unless you are weak, unless you can't do it, there is no real testimony to speak of. Your testimony is born 
when you're pushed to the limit and you start relying on God. When you're driven to the point you didn't know you could reach or surpassed. When you look around and think there is no way out of a situation, there rests your testimony because there you rest on the power of God. God begins where we stop. God says, my grace is sufficient. He goes on working in the background and works things in our favour and according to his plan when our efforts have run out. His sovereignty is such that even when we do not realise it, he is working things for our good. And the beauty of grace and why it's sufficient is that there is no merit required on our part. We're simply asked to yield and to trust. We do this only by grace. My grace is sufficient for you, he says. I am content with weakness, with insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. So let us now join together in what we believe as Christians in the word of the creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism, for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So now let us pray. In the power of the Spirit and in unity with Christ, let us pray to the Father for the Church and its work here on earth. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for the ministry of your Son, Jesus. Fill us with your Spirit and support us by your gentle hands, that we may persevere in speaking your word and living our faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, as we prepare to share in the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, through our Holy Communion, grant us the grace to share in his life in the world through faithful witness. Teach us how to be open with others about our faith in him, to speak the truth in love, humbly and without shame. Teach us how to rely on you in the power of the Spirit and not on ourselves. Let us seek no reward than to know that we will receive what is promised to faithful witnesses. The reward of knowing you and being known by you in the communion of all the saints forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ever-present God, you come to us through the teaching of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
risen and manifest in every place and time. Grant that our eyes and ears may be open to his wisdom and healing. Send us out with authority as Jesus sent his disciples. Teach us how to be sensitive to the culture in which we live and to hear and understand its needs. Teach us how to trust you in the journey of life and to know that you go before us. Open our ears to hear your word and draw us closer to you that the whole world may be one with you as you are one with us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ever loving and mighty God, when we pray, help us to listen, really listen. Clear us of our prejudices and skepticism as we seek the courage to join with you and to open our heart to know you and know the life that is your will for us. Help us be patient with the imperfections in and around us and see how you use the church to bless the world. Help us to be ones who help instead of stand by at the side and criticize. To be ones who love instead of hate, who trust instead of fear, who plant rather than pluck up what has been planted. Strengthen our faith when there is rejection so that we do not close down but look beyond that rejection to pave a way to spread the vision of a new world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are unwell due to the coronavirus. In your compassion, grant them strength and healing. We pray for all who are anxious about loved ones, friends and neighbours. And enable them to trust in you and be steadfast in hope. We pray for all those who feel isolated or alone, that they may experience your loving presence. We pray for all in authority who face difficult decisions that affect the lives of many, that you will grant them wisdom and courage. We pray for traders, and employees who are fearful of the future, that businesses may be secured, jobs protected, and families supported. We pray for all those facing financial hardship, that you would support and sustain them. We pray for all in education, at this uncertain time. Inspire those who feel bored or directionless. Protect the vulnerable and give fresh hope to the dismayed. We remember those who have lost their lives. We pray for those who weep and mourn, that they may find comfort and hope in you. Lord of life, in this time of crisis, crisis for our families and communities, our nation and our world, we turn to you in faith to seek your guidance and receive your blessing, knowing that nothing in all creation can separate us from your love made known to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we share the peace with each other. Peace to you from God our Heavenly Father. Peace from his Son, Jesus Christ, who is our peace. Peace from the Holy Spirit, the life giver. And the peace of the triune God be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. By your Holy Spirit, you make us your friends. And so we gladly thank you, with saints and angels praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit that broken bread and wine outpoured may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the nights before he died, he had supper with his friends. And taking bread, he praised you, broke the bread, gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shared for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his one perfect sacrifice made for all on the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feed at your table in heaven. Through Christ, with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. 
we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. <coughs> the body of Christ, keep you in eternal life. The blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Let us pray. God of our pilgrimage, you have led us to the living water. Refresh and sustain us as we go forward on our journey. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we say together, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. The Lord be with you. May God give you his blessing in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. And thank you for joining us in this communion service. Mm -hmm.